I would like to present now Professor Anna Pereira Rodet from Eindhoven University. She is a partner in our World Heritage Studies program. So all of those who are interested in a kind of cooperation with Eindhoven, please contact her. Anna is, uh, <laughs> Anna is guest researcher and, uh, in, in the by, for funded by the Foundation for Science and Technology from the Ministry of Science and Technology and Higher Education. She was, she was, this is bad managed here. I cannot, <laughs> she's co-editor and this is very important. We will, we will show you the, 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 the book, the, the series. Uh, of the Journal of Cultural Heritage Management and Sustainable Development, and uh, she is an architect. She is working on the world, in the World Heritage System and about World Heritage for... How long have you work, been working on it? I'll show them. Okay, I'm so then I'll stop it here <laughs> now, I think. <laughs> okay, so Anna Pereira from Eindhoven. Okay, now I come closer because then uh, also my voice is... Uh, is louder and good for the video. Um, thank you, everyone. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Um, coming to Cottbus is always very exciting because, by principle, we have a, a full room of students uh, full of questions and debate and discussion uh, that I do not always have in Eindhoven with the plain architects and urban planners that and the pla urban planners, sorry, urban planners that uh, not always want to discuss heritage. So I'm always very happy. And, um, and I would like to share you one of my uh, uh, most important uh, mottos um, so that you also know a bit uh, behind this, uh, as uh, our colleague was saying, behind my narrative today, uh, what I stand for. And, and I really believe that if we are seeing things uh, are not correct or if we would prefer it to be otherwise, then, then it's too easy to be critical. And uh, it's just too easy. And so if you want to do the step forward, if you want to change it, that's the fun part. And it's not going to be easy, um, but nothing that it's easy is as exciting. So you have to keep on pushing walls and, uh, and exploring ideas. And that's what I kept doing. And I keep doing, so I'm like those dolls uh, going down and up. Um, when uh, things don't go so well, and I would uh, motivate you to think the same. Uh, and, and also another aspect who, who triggered me as, um, as an architecture student, um, and it was randomly in a, in a history of, of architecture lecture, um, was, was, um, was this sentence. And, and first, I, I didn't think it very much true, but it, it actually influenced and, and, and steered me uh, towards understanding more about what exactly this means. Uh, because it is by principle assumed um, that value is, is underlying heritage conservation um, and that no society uh, conserves what it does not value. And first, as an architect, listening this from a professor, knowledge professor, and even being re uh, referencing uh, a very um, distingu distinguished colleagues in Getty Conservation Institute, I took it as true. I assumed it was true. So I kept saying it over and over again without questioning. But the more I study and uh, the more uh, you, will, you will see my, prof my profile and my um, progress over the years, the more I keep questioning if this is actually true. And I'm very triggered to, to dedicate my career and my research and my projects to really try to understand what moves us to decide what and not to protect in a city, if that's tangible or intangible, if that's movable, immovable. I'm very curious to what do we choose to understand, what do we choose from the past, and the, how does that influence our decision making? I find it fascinating. So that's where the, the, the process I'm going to take you through um, during this lecture. And I hope uh, that maybe of you can contribute to it in the future because that's a lot to research on. So I'll tell you a little bit about my progress uh, and or my process because I'm, I'm, 
you would not expect that an architecture becomes in love with research. Uh, you would not expect that, because in our education and in our curriculum, if you do not become a student, a student or a trainee of Rem Colas or another big major company, you are a failure. And, and, but I had so many questions and, and I, I wanted to, I was triggered by how society was developing and cities were transforming, um, that I was too, too uh, how do you say, I was someone with other people would feel very uncomfortable because I just kept raising questions and kept raising questions while mainly architects, they want to make statements. So there was some contradiction there, so I thought, okay, maybe I should try to find my answers or at least part of my answers. And that's when I de decided to, um, to become an academic and to start doing research. But that all got triggered um, when I moved to Florence as an Erasmus student and uh, I started interactive with different colleagues from different disciplines and I realized how biased we are how our culture shapes the way we see and perceive um, reality. And the way I found to control that, to control my own biases and keep questioning my own biases and my own assumptions was by cooperating with different disciplines with their own biases so I could uh, constantly check. And also international cooperations because also again the cultural bias uh, could be flagged on and I could further understand my own assumptions. So you see a lot of jumping, you see architecture, building technology, archaeology, urban planning, and I find it very exciting every time to uh, cooperate with uh, experts from different disciplines because also in a way it helps me understand better not only how I perceive uh, the problems um, but also who I am uh, as an expert. So you see, and, and there all, all of a sudden you see a journal coming up because it comes back to my motto of be the change you want to see in the world because I was facing a lot of disciplinary bias when I was uh, um, trying and applying for submitting articles on, uh, on, my, uh, on my topic. Uh, and if I would submit to urban planning, they would say, oh, you should publish on heritage studies. If I go to publish on heritage studies, or you're not critical enough, you should publish on urban planning. Or if you, so I was always there in between. I was always out of the scope of the journal. So I say, you know what? I create a journal, and that's what I did. So I convinced the publisher that it was a great idea. And since 2011, we finally have a, uh, a platform where um, scholars from different disciplines, they can just publish their work as long as they are consistent explaining their methods, the connection to the state of the art, and their conclusions. And if they are contradictory to what I believe in, even better, because then we can all learn from each other that different perspectives can lead into different conclusions. And that's what I love about science. So if you think about publishing on your research, feel free to uh, submit your articles to our journal. So this is a bit my, my background, so now you know also a bit more who I am. Um, and then I try to organize the content of my lecture in, a bit on this, in, in this way of reasoning and structure. And I ended up uh, taking uh, a bit uh, of what am I doing. Uh, but if you're interested, then that part of the PowerPoint is also there. And, and then I'll give you hints on where, to find, where you can find my work and even the, the team we are working with. But I thought it was inter more interesting that, that we, we take a broader perspective and also we spice up the discussion afterwards, which I look forward to. Okay, so let's start with sustainable development. <clears throat> and that's the, the flagship of urban planning. They want to help their cities and their governance and, and their communities to reach sustainability and have a sustainable development. And we, we know why. There's a lot of publications going on, a lot of uh, uh, um, urban uh, theory uh, experts writing and even um, studying. Uh, the global world, and here you have some sentences, but basically what they say is that there are uh, four key global drives and global f changes which have to do with climate change, which have to do with migration, um, which have to do with uh, 
uh, ECT and developments and, and so on, and urban expansion. So you see a lot happening, and it's very interesting to see how different cities worldwide react to, the, to similar challenges. And that's, that's where my uh, interest for global studies uh, comes from, to compare and understand the differences and the similarities. And what is interesting is, is that there's no consensus. Uh, you have studies trying to understand, okay, models of CD, models of expansion, models of transformation, and there's still not con no consensus there on either if there is one or more solutions. But there's also little research on it. So please, <laughs> if you want to study more and try to understand exactly what is happening on those cities and how do they relate to these issues, there's enough work to do and uh, there are not enough case studies to add to it. And, and what I try, what would like to try to illustrate is that, as, as we say um, in, uh, in Europe, there's not just one road to Rome. There are many roads to Rome. So we all want sustainable development. We all interpret in our own ways and cities do it as well, not only academics. And you see, for example, here the example of, of uh, New York, where you see a clear densification, where the city grew, and there's a transformation on typology, a transformation on the, the dynamics of the city. But you also have other cities or other urban settlements that just all of a sudden uh, expand and, and, and uh, totally uh, develop uh, incredibly. And you have, at the same time, other uh, urban areas which you could conclude if you just make a type of morphological analysis that maybe that's not much going on, not much changing, but when you go inside more into the intangible dimensions, traditions, functions, dynamics, it, it is maybe one of the, the most um, city, or the cities who change the most in their own dynamics. So it's very interesting to see. Another, another example, so I try to, to show you diversity, so, so that by principle there's not just one solution. And you see also the other way around, you see fully densified areas being converted into parks uh, as well. And you have, again, um, other situations which do to also uh, healing and memory and um, and, uh, and, and, and still uncertainty on what to do, uh, areas that stay on hold for years because they are still uh, determining and, 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 and brainstorming on what exactly should happen. But it's not that they don't value it, it's that, that it's still too, too difficult to decide what to do and if they are making the good choice. So there are several scenarios for the development of Robben Island uh, but primarily now it's, it's just being used as museum. Uh, one part of the city can be visited through uh, with a bus if you have not been there before. So that triggered me to try to understand exactly because you often have this uh, cliche of uh, conservation against development. So, and the conservation are, are the boring people that uh, stop everything and the developers are the innovative, fantastic, uh, perfect uh, 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 illusion and, and I like to try to understand exactly what is there that actually works within conservation without being judgmental up front. So in my PhD I developed some, some, um, some ideas to try to really understand what is behind those, those interventions and what is behind um, those intentions and, and if you want to join the publication discussing this uh, uh, you're welcome. Uh, this was uh, developed more recently when I developed further from my PhD, where I try really to understand what, what is the aim behind the intervention. And what is interesting is that sometimes interventions um, that take place in, in uh, urban areas, they combine these different aims, but somehow there is a leading one. There is always a leading one that very much, sometimes is very much connected to uh, the aim of the, 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 the architect or the urban design or, or, the, or the political strategy. And I try to understand exactly the differences. So it's not yet, I'm not fully satisfied. That's often uh, something uh, 
maybe many, I share with many academics, it's, it's never finished. So as I told you, I started already thinking about it and differentiating um, in my PhD, and that was 2007, so we are a few years after. But, but it's very interesting to try really to understand what exactly happens. Um, and, and sometimes you see, especially when you start working with different case studies all over the world, you see that words, and you come back to narratives, words are actually being used differently. And that's very exciting to see if in a country you use restoration uh, when other countries are using conservation and other countries are using uh, rehabilitation when they are, they are meaning the same in terms of aims. What, what are their aims? And that's what I find fa fascinating. Uh, so this is just a conceptual framework. We could go back to cities and try to understand on their projects what are the aims behind it. But then I also find interesting because you have sustainable development and in the, the most recent definitions and, and uh, the ones which are taken forward uh, by, um, by urban planning, you will see it later on, is primarily the social, economic, uh, ecological, and, and sometimes instead of ecological, they call it environmental. But you always have there at, as, a, as a front source uh, the present and the future. Uh, and by principle, when you have a city and you inherit a, inherit a city and you have to handle the past as well. So it's very tr interesting to try to understand if a development is driven uh, towards the future because they have great ambitions and hopes and they think the future is going to solve everything or if instead they say more um, uh, respectful and uh, connected to their past and willing really to uh, protect their identity and their cultures. So I, I find very interesting and, and maybe I'm um, I'm, I'm, my mind is just classification systems all connected with each other, but I, try, I always try to go to cities and try to understand the discussions and the, the challenges and try to see where they position, because then sometimes you can understand much better what is going on there uh, than just assuming uh, they are doing uh, things uh, differently or even uh, wrong, as some colleagues do. And then... Uh, some, uh, 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 there was recently a project which tried to understand uh, what is the role of culture within sustainable development. And, and you can see that they identified also different ways on how culture is integrated within uh, sustainable development. Either as a, as a fourth pillar, and you have seen the fights of, of UNESCO trying to advocate for uh, in the past years to try to put culture as a, as a fourth pillar, but you also see in some situations um, the model where culture is the connection and the model of a moralistic approach where culture is everything that is related to um, humankind and it's a far more holistic uh, perspective of culture. And again, it's very interesting to understand that the moment a city or even a country takes a perspective, to see what happens to their urban planning and their, the ways they handle their cities. But again, like I told you, I show you all these variations and diversity, and that's very interesting. Um, I would like to advocate that, that, that due to this um, multi-interpretation and these different narratives, often it's, it's put it forward in literature as being negative, but I find it the, the most, uh, I find it very interesting because uh, it actually proves how different cultures interpret and perceive how sustainable development can be implemented on their, um, on their own cultures. But then it might seem that then because they are using different uh, criteria that then one model of sustainability for a city is seen by another city or by another culture as completely unsustainable. So that's very interesting to compare and understand. So now I'm moving more towards urban policy and I'll go back to those values because uh, I told you I'm an architect so I always try to learn from other disciplines and these colleagues try to understand and, uh, and they actually define urban planning as a problem solution. They, that their, their science uh, was uh, 
born to, to handle conflicts and to understand the conflicts between these different values and these different interests. Uh, so you see him theorizing that between all these values uh, coming from ecology and economy and, and social, you, had, you have naturally conflicts emerging between, uh, between them. And uh, I'm not going much more into detail, uh, um, but, but then if you want, I can give you the reference of the publication. But it's very much to, interesting to see how they immediately see it and link it to the conflicts happening. And how he argues is, is that there is, again, linking to narr narratives and to interpretations, uh, many misunderstandings coming up between uh, the different languages and the disciplines. Um, and also, um, there is this, this, this difficulty which they, he argues that it has to do with, the, with um, the classification of splitting culture and nature as totally um, apart and man versus nurture uh, apart from it. So he, he goes a bit back into it. And of course, there are more planning tools, so, and I, don't, I would not dare to try to cover all of them today. So I'm, I'm particularly focusing on urban policy, as I promised, and that is much more grounded at, uh, at the level of regulation and trying to, to, to make sure that everyone gets a fair, uh, a fair game, that there are rules that everyone complies, and we know that that does not happen in urban planning all the time in cities. We are very aware of it, of it because uh, at, uh, lawyers often put exceptions within, <laughs> within the policies, so there's ways to escape. But in principle, policy and regulation was, was developed and created to try to make sure everyone gets a, a fair treatment. And now it's a bit just to tease you uh, and, and put some cartoons so that maybe you, you think about it. Um, because there's often this discussion uh, about uh, the top-down approach and then I'll, I'll put another funny one on the bottom-up approach. But it still remains a, a, a challenge um, when you see theories and the case studies coming up where they study this, this, uh, these differences is that in the end it's very much about who has been involved rather than who started the process in the end and who takes the decision. So even, even in situations where it's top-down approach or other situations where you have a bottom-up approach, it's very much interesting to understand exactly who are those people in the bus, who are making the decisions, who are delaying the progress, etc. And that's why I think also Christina um, you have to bear with me with cartoons because I'm, I'm still a, <laughs> I'm just 10 years researcher, so I try to make it a bit more fun. Um, uh, it, like Christina said, often in UNESCO, it, it is a lot of, 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 of the state parties who are there and, and understanding. It's very much interesting to try to understand the different stakeholders and their roles in it. And now I go more into... Um, administration and public administration and, and theories related to that that somehow linked and correlate with urban planning and that's uh, an, an expectation of what you could uh, of a recommendation of best practices of what you could have to to monitor and implement your resources and immediately if you would have a PhD on this comparing it with the World Heritage Convention would be amazing but, but it's, it's very interesting to see how in administration theory and institutional theory, they, they try to uh, connect and integrate all. And I'm going to show you a few examples so that you also understand uh, that often you see in literature the discussion of Europe, of Eurocentric or Western. And, 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 and when you do... Uh, studies to try to understand exactly their planning and their governance and, and their models, there's a lot of diversity there as well. So I would rather prefer myself as an as a, as a academic to try to understand the differences of these models of governance and even how urban planning is identified uh, and then see how effective is that and if it helps them protect or not their resources and their heritage. So this is just from an European project. Uh, I didn't find uh, uh, research trying to do a similar thing worldwide, so that's why I bring you an example of, of Europe. 
but it already shows, you see the, the diversity of colors, right? It already shows you the, the differences. And unfortunately, uh, for my own country, for Portugal, we are always uh, below <laughs> what is expected in development, but that's something also I have to learn to understand. Uh, but you see here the, the diversity in colors, and, and they try to understand exactly, it goes a bit into geopolitics, but it would more focus, here's uh, the Eurogeographics, here they, they try to understand how multi-level governance work, and what I mean by multi-level governance is um, this model uh, we have adopted with the, the, the starting up of the European Commission and then having uh, the countries and some even the federal uh, states and then the, the, the cities and how they take decisions and how that influence planning. Um, and you see again how diverse that is and how it is implemented. Again, then if you have this multi-level governance, how do they cooperate with each other? And I'm just doing, uh, I took some, some of the most uh, exciting maps from a big report they, they published. All this is online if later on you want to discuss diversity. Um, but but it, it was more to, to stand up a point that, that often, uh, even within a certain country, and you will see, there, there, there is this diversity again, depending on their communities and their models of, of planning. And here you see, again, more zooming in into planning that there are four uh, uh, theories on, on, or approaches on how you focus your planning and the decision making. And you see again a, a big difference between the North and the, and, and the South in uh, Europe. Yes, and, and then they, they ranked and they try to understand, okay, how does that work uh, cross-sectorial as well, and interdisciplinary, and you see again and scaling coming up on, uh, on the results. It's, it's a very exciting uh, project. And then they do all this uh, very extraordinary maps uh, and, and, and theoretical frameworks to try to understand it more generally. And you see here again uh, the top, top, uh, top down, bottom up approach and try to understand exactly what the, how does that relate to government and to uh, the governance tools. And this is a study which was done in 2006. So further studies or even having more cities and comparing it could be very interesting to understand exactly how does this uh, uh, emphasize on soft laws or hard laws, how going from a more integral to a more traditional approach, what are the styles exactly or the models our cities are implementing? And what they concluded with their case studies uh, and here I'm showing some, uh, some, uh, some uh, graphs they, they published, was, um, was a, a very strong gap in this, in this area. So this can also be very interesting to understand, now this is a general outcome, but of course they had such a spider web for each city, they took a case study. So it's very interesting to see and they, they can learn from each other exactly what, what is going on uh, uh, in, uh, within the, the case studies. Then, of course, the catalyst is the positive part, the barriers, because they try to bring the positive and the negative aspects of it. And you see um, uh, all, the, all the limitations and uh, the struggles that, uh, that are being addressed uh, in urban planning and that the experts and the officers, uh, uh, local officers, uh, um, shared as being problematic and you see what it isn't. So you can also try to understand, okay, where there's no problem, how did they solve that and how could this uh, lessons be shared? Um, again, they also asked about um, um, failures and successes and how can you try to understand uh, how things can improve in, in urban planning and you see um, some, uh, some, different, uh, some differences there that are very uh, going more, you see a consensus um, as, a, as, a, as an intention that they feel it as a priority, uh, but also spatial vision. So this was all set up by them to try to understand uh, the differences in urban planning. And as last, because I also showed you the, the general graph in Europe and the diversity, then when you put them all together, you try to understand exactly uh, where is the movement uh, within Europe, but you could try to see that later on 
uh, with other regions uh, and try to see what exactly is, is helping and, uh, and how do they think European directives are, are supporting them on their ambitions. So this is just an example. It, uh, you do not need to, to do it in such a way, but, um, but already it gives an overview on how diverse uh, cultures and cities can be even within one Western European uh, um, um, bucket, <laughs> you could call. And now I'll try to move a bit more towards UNESCO and heritage because I told you about the multi-level governance and also UNESCO plays a role in this uh, multi-level governance in the level of supranational uh, governance and supranational laws. Uh, international laws, and, um, and I find it very interesting to try to understand how do cities um, take advantage of it or use it or misuse it, you could say it in some, in some situations, um, in, their, in, their, um, in their plans and their strategies. And, and all, I, th I don't know if I, I took it out in the end, but there are also very interesting articles, and um, I wrote one myself, which I'm showing you a few of the data that supported those arguments, where, where uh, somehow, um, and in some situations, you see UNESCO being used as a scapegoat. So it, it's, it's, it's UNESCO to blame. Uh, it's very easy to say someone uh, else has the blame instead of looking at uh, national and regional and local problems which are often uh, being the cause for the trouble. So I, I always try to understand, okay, is, is in fact UNESCO an obstacle? If, and if that's the case, we can learn from it. Or is it being used in such a way, um, as, a, as I had uh, one example in, in, a, in a Canada, um, the, the park the, uh, with a um, ski, yeah, in Banff, where actually the urban area, it's purposely not, not included in the, in the nomination, but then the urban planner there, he uses as a flagship, no, no, you didn't, UNESCO does not allow you to, uh, to build uh, different than the typology which was recommended in the, the urban planning law, but I told him, you know, that's not true, right? He said, yeah, but they don't know it. So you, you, you send already a message uh, that, that UNESCO is, is blocking this development different than the typology when actually he does not have the courage to tell them um, himself. So it's very interesting to see the dynamics and how the different cities and their planning, how they use UNESCO as a tool again. And of course, uh, the celebration of diversity, the celebration of uh, different uh, cultures and identities and values that you can, you have a wealth of knowledge there that you can learn from it uh, more than we are doing at the moment. So it's, it's very interesting to, to try to understand the list and its attributes and values. I'd like to now go a bit further more into and bridging a bit into the presentation of, uh, of Christina uh, about who is behind UNESCO. Uh, because often, sometimes, often and sometimes, or even uh, all the time, when I'm attending conferences, I often get this, this feeling uh, from professors and even students um, that, uh, that, uh, that UNESCO is to blame. So I, I try, I was very curious and tried to understand exactly what is happening there and if it's really aerocentric as some, uh, um, some articles point forward. Because as I told you, I have a lot of questions and I have this terrible uh, um, um, mindset when, when I don't even believe in myself. So why should I believe the articles which are written? So I really try to understand what is written, how, it, how is it written, why, what is the background? And, and then here you can see that uh, since the beginning, there is a strong representation of other countries from, from other uh, regions. So it's, it's only later in time that actually the, the number of, um, of uh, European countries, um, and even if you distinguish within UNESCO and not the UNESCO World Heritage um, uh, differences in regions, that even European countries were, were majority. It, 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 it's, it's almost not there. So 
why, why is this uh, criticism against uh, Europe and uh, Eurocentric uh, theories? And then I tried to see, okay, as well, what are the reference texts? When are they published? What kind of reference texts they are? Because you see there are uh, differences. Some are conventions, some are uh, recommendations, some are declarations, and they are, have all different uh, rules on, and, and ways of influence. So for example, conventions, the countries need to ratify, while recommendations they don't. So you can try to see if, if they are going more towards or not uh, the commitment of, uh, of uh, and, and what uh, type of, of uh, topics they put into conventions and what type of, com of, uh, of, of fields they don't. And I try to make a, a small distinction between, uh, between uh, the specific reference texts that were referencing heritage uh, and addressing heritage um, in particular. And you can see here uh, a, a very different um, range of, of conventions and recommendations uh, where, which I distinguished in, in terms of disciplinary, cultural, natural, and cultural and natural to try to understand this integration of disciplines. Um, so it, it, um, it is primarily to, to understand this and you can see that it's curious that you have up uh, the convention, the World Heritage Convention, and then you have it again, the historic urban landscape, which I will uh, go into more detail later on. Uh, but the that somehow there was uh, a wave of, of, of recommendations and, and conventions which were needed to address specific, specific uh, categories of, of heritage and to give them the proper attention. And they are very interesting uh, to, to, to read. And, um, and understand what are their aims, what are their values, and how they relate to each other. So then we go more into urban, uh, to, to world heritage in, uh, in specific, and as Christina mentioned, there are oh, 198 state parties, and again here you see the differences from the regions and their adoption, and their, their patterns of adoption. Um, and you, see, you have seen before there were 100, 195, so now uh, that's why it's almost universal, because we are just missing uh, four UNESCO uh, states parties. And a recent paper I told you that, uh, that I, I entitled UNESCO to blame, I tried to start understanding um, exactly what was who was behind and uh, um, which were the countries behind uh, decisions and and I try to understand um, the, the designation of properties while those uh, specific countries are in the committee. Because there has been uh, some discussion if you should nominate your own property and if that would be ethical or, or even um, if they would not bring conflict of interests. But you can see, and, and the argument of the first assumption I had is that due to this growth of politicism, of politicization that was reported in the audits, that actually should be something that we would find much more on the last decades. Uh, but it was actually something which was already, always there. Uh, so th this was interesting to, to find out by analyzing. And, and those lists of countries which are there uh, in, the, in the corner are the only countries which never nominated a property uh, while in the, in the committee. So they don't have uh, a history of it. Uh, and I just put some examples of, um, of, of the most extreme cases within the region uh, where you have the, the ratio of nominations outside the committee and inside the committee. So, and the total, so for Mexico, the total is 31, and you see how many they do uh, nominate while they are in the committee, and, and to the extreme of Egypt that only nominates uh, while they are in the committee. But it's not the only one. And, and also my intention is not to blame the countries, but to try to understand a bit more into the politics, and because I, I, I thought that there would be much more there that actually never 
uh, nominated on the, while they were in the committee. So the, it was proven that there are very few, but it was also proven that when you analyze it, that it was already something which was there since the beginning. And that was interesting to find out. Another analysis we did uh, was to try to understand exactly uh, which values are, um, are connected to the OUV and, uh, and, to, uh, and to the differences in properties over time. So we, we classify the criteria and by applying the criteria then we could have this, uh, this overview. And you can see already that when you compare um, the, the, the beginning and more recently, that there is a decrease of, uh, of historic, uh, historic values and there is an increase of social values. So, and, and that's what I find interesting, to try to analyze the documents and, and all the sources we have already because UNESCO put them online and put them more and more online uh, over the years to really to try to understand already what is there that we can learn from. And of course then to co complement it with case studies. So then I go into uh, uh, one of uh, our favorite uh, research lines, which has to do to really try to understand where exactly uh, nominations of world heritage land uh, uh, in, in the planet. And, um, and if you do this search in UNESCO uh, um, website, uh, and, and that is possibly recently, you find out that there are 130 properties. How many do you think that there are? Do you, do you think it's 130 is real? No? 1,000? Properties or cities? Property. Yeah, and properties and 1,000 is the whole list, right? Yeah, but I'm talking who, which one of them are in urban settlements. Yeah, you're sure? Okay, let's see, let's see, let's find out. Because we did, I started in 2010, making an analysis and trying to understand exactly how does uh, outstanding universal value relates to urban, urban areas and urban settlements. And by then, in 2010, um, it was quite challenging because uh, the, the maps, not all the maps have uh, as good quality. Uh, and also then we would have, to, I, had, I had to go constantly to Google Maps and to show and to search uh, lists of cities. Uh, so it was a, a bit of a complex uh, situation which maybe could improve in the future. Uh, and also the coordinates which UNESCO has are not always, um, Correct, so they, are, they send you to one point and maybe the property is uh, all over everywhere. So, but we try to understand exactly, and you see where it's coming from. You see the singular typology where you have a church, a castle, uh, uh, um, a museum. Um, so the, the, the monuments uh, vision, this monument uh, beginning of, of conservation, and then I try to understand, okay, what is it if it's fragmented? So you have different spots and could even be either within one nomination or, um, or with different nominations. And you have, for example, London with even four nominations. Um, and that brings it into urban planning into an interesting perspective. And you know how controversial urban planning is being discussed in, in London at the moment with the high rise buildings. So I also always try to understand, okay, if value matters, what is happening to those cities who have those OUV values? What is happening to urban planning and their transformation? And then you have those absolute uh, urban settlements where they have chosen to, to take it as a whole and to uh, nominate it the entire city or urban settlement. And you often see that in cultural landscapes as well, where you have a broader cultural landscape and the city is within the cultural landscape. And basically the second one, the second level of, of the typologies is all the same, but then they are sharing the OUV. So it's when you have different cities within a nomination and, uh, and, then, um, and then it might be just the churches, or, but it can also be historic centers or industrial areas and, 
and uh, the Silk Road. So you have this uh, this this uh, growing. Um, well, I'm already telling you a bit of the solution, but you, ha you have this, this category which has been widely explored over the years. And we try to do it online, so if you want to search it, um, uh, the, the locations we try to do with the students to put them all online with GIS. It's not 100% accurate because uh, the Bing, Bing maps and the UNESCO and the maps did not always match, but that's what we have so far. And Further students on, I'm trying to convince further students of uh, geography primarily to try to progress on this idea to, to map them all and try to understand um, their, their morphologies. Okay, so now it goes. Are you ready? Yeah? I, we found more than 1,600 urban settlements with this analysis going map to map, trying to understand how many urban settlements were there, what were their categories. And you see, you see the amazing growth over the last year. So when I published, let me see, you taught me to use the, when I published and we attended the conference together in Evra, Christina, I, I was here and I was already flagging Hmm, this does not smell right. What is going on? Because I would see this, this, this loop grow, growing up in relationship to a totally different pattern here before and also the growth of categories. But then all of a sudden, many, many uh, countries started nominating serial, serial nominations and cultural landscapes where you have one property with 30, with 40, with 50 urban settlements and it's, it's very huge. So it raises a lot of issues on urban planning. How are you going to coincide all those different urban settlements and the protection of the OUV? So it's, it's very challenging and very interesting because now we can see how many they are and, and also who to work with, where to choose the case studies to compare and understand. And in particular, in my own agenda, I want to, to try to understand if the decision to, 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 to delimitate affects that protection. So the, all these different categories, if you just choose the, the church or if you choose the historic center or you choose the entire city, how does that bring and help solving conflicts or not? So it's very exciting. And you can see here, I put some uh, comparative, uh, some, some similar uh, graphs when I published in 2010 and now. And you can see the, the growth of uh, scale B. You see there, it was already enormous. Uh, and you see that the category A of individual OUVs was 37%, now it went to 24%, so it, it's really a huge growth. But also the, the, um, the different categories, so the, the monument, the historic center, there, there was there a kind of funny relationship, almost symmetrical, which is now going completely blurry into huge, complete uh, urban settlements within cultural landscapes which are designated. So in theory, the policy should be uh, inter integral as well. And uh, we, you, you will learn it's not the case. And again, like I told you, I like to see the countries behind it. And you will see that uh, France has about 20%, 20 percent, 20 percent of the entire list of World Heritage Cities. And, and don't take me wrong, because I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret this. This cannot be another PhD. So I'm telling you today, like about 30 PhD uh, researchers you could follow, because there, there could be a reason related to the fact that Paris is, uh, the UNESCO is there. They well, and that's something uh, Patricia I could compliment to Patricia. All these gentlemen's agreements of the convention and putting forward and political strategies and co-funding, France chose to host and offer the building to host UNESCO. And you see that impact. I don't know if it's related, if it's related to awareness, if it's related to, I don't know because I did not research, but it could be interesting to try to understand why is this unproportioned awareness and willingness to protect their heritage uh, than to the others. So if you, would go, if you would like to go a bit further and say, okay, if we take 
those misleading or the ones with a different pattern. You could even argue that the list is rather uh, representative all over the world if you take those exceptions. So it's, it's a lot of things we could discuss, but this already allows it to, to discuss further and try to understand what is going on. So now I go a bit more into um, a different uh, platform, and that's the historic urban landscape uh, recommendation. And I see I'm, I'm going, uh, yeah, I'm okay still? You're not tired? <laughs> okay, so let's go. In the historic urban landscape. And you have seen, I showed you that it was on the, on the, um, on the level where it tries to integrate na nature and, and culture together. And probably you already know um, uh, this, uh, w what I'm telling, but, uh, but somehow it's controversial. And in the first years was, was very controversial um, when I would attend conferences and discuss with professors because you would have this tendency for those which are pro-development to see this, oh, it's one more charter. They want to even frozen more cities and not let anything happen to the cities. While the conservatives uh, would, would have actually uh, nicknamed it as the development charter because it would allow discussion, it would allow development to take place. So it was very funny that all of a sudden you had a, a recommendation which both parties, extreme parties, were, were a bit nervous about what was going to happen. So it's very curious to try to understand how the different countries are reacting to it, and especially how cities are taking it on board and trying to, to discuss it further. And you have many cities worldwide. But I'll just give you some insights. And basically what the historic Cuban landscape approach is that they, they stimulate really the learning process. So you say, okay, you, you see this instrument, you try to adapt it to your own context, you disseminate it, you facilitate it, and then you monitor. And if you're not happy, you change again, and you keep changing until it suits your uh, city, your uh, historic Cuban landscape, and you keep, keep uh, learning through the cycle. So uh, going it further on the definition of, of a smart city, trying to make it as a process of learning and a process of of uh, adjusting uh, their policies and, uh, and, um, and their, their governance uh, strategies. And uh, in the beginning, in the draft periods, um, this uh, six steps used to be there and they, they were taken out. Uh, so you don't see it uh, in the official text. There was a lot of discussion and in the end they decided to take it out. But basically, uh, we have been uh, exploring it because, of course, if they took it out, then I find it interesting to understand why and, and why it was so controversial to have them there. So we have been using, and uh, uh, one PhD of, uh, of mine who just finished uh, uh, last uh, month um, defended, uh, she tried to explore it further. But actually what you see here is the integration of uh, discussion and dialogue and diversity because it's not telling you you should protect monuments, you should protect intangible heritage, you should protect, it's not telling you anymore, it's telling you, you decide, you map your resources and in the cities you decide what you protect and how you protect it and then you assess how vulnerable it is so that you can make a better decision and make a better development, urban development framework but then, of course, you don't have resources for everything, right? So th there's very limited resources and you need to prioritize. And this is very much inherent to heritage uh, management, that you need to prioritize what to do and not. But as well, the, the difference is, is that it's no longer expected that just the government does it. So if it's a common heritage, if it's values we share, and um, and, and if we are up to it, then you try to establish partnerships which allow this to happen. And, and, and what is interesting is that we keep questioning cities and, and local, national governments of, of these steps and, and, and what, what do they think about them. And it's interesting to see that even within one city, um, they, they recognize the steps, they all do them, they, they do not say, oh, there's something we don't do. But they don't do it for everything. 
and they don't do it from the holistic perspective that you start on resources. So you have cities that invert the, the process and where do they do what, and very much sometimes even they start here and then they go and map because they get a project, they get a, a political agenda, and then they have their priorities established and the friends and the partnerships, and then they go back and monitor and map resources. So it's very interesting, I, I, even though we could say, oh, it's not complete or it could be otherwise, it's true, but if you take something as base, you can start comparing and understanding the reactions of people over time and suggest it to improve. So that's what we have been doing. And you see here some examples, and primarily uh, Ron Verneurs had been leading this project uh, all over the world, trying to discuss with local communities by means of workshops, but also of research projects, of master thesis, of PhD researchers, try to understand the different cities, how they position themselves, what are their struggles, and how could they move forward. And it's very interesting to, to understand uh, the whole process of it. Um, so, and if you look at uh, publications, uh, there's, there's a, a growing group of publications um, more and more. So, and and you, tr you can try to see already that there is an interest to try to address specific case studies. Uh, and, and that is the majority. So you see cities, um, and even yesterday there was a big event organized by Ballarat in Australia, uh, trying to, uh, to push forward a discussion. You see primarily on the bottom up, uh, um, but also at the same time at the top down, uh, workshops being created and, and uh, cities willing to explore what does exactly mean to, to have this integrated approach. But you also see uh, some studies being done trying to understand the country and its national policy uh, to try to, to uh, understand patterns and define patterns as we've seen in China, but it's still very much evolving, so there's uh, a lot to do. And then I, I would like to finish, and maybe it can uh, uh, spice a bit our discussion um, with, with these topics, but we don't need to cover them all, but you can always email me later if you, if you have ideas on, on, uh, on these questions. Uh, because I often, I, as, as I told you, I, I often see uh, UNESCO being used on a positive sense and a ne negative sense, and I always try to understand the context on where that is happening. And I think that if we understand the context, we can learn far more uh, of, of the whole dynamics and how exactly planning uh, and governance is, um, is taking place. And a last uh, a motivation. Join the club, be the change, work on it, and, uh, and thank you.